Hi everyone, Stefano here from Sonic Cinema. Welcome to a brand new episode of Behind the Music. Today I'm incredibly excited to be speaking with composer extraordinaire Patrick Johnson. Patrick is an amazing composer, Emmy nominated, known for combining orchestral and electronic music, creating incredible sound palettes. He wrote the music for the Oscar winning documentary The White Helmets, Oscar nominated feature documentary Purunga. Black Earth Rising on BBC2 and wrote additional music on the Alienist, the hit series from Netflix. So today we'll be discussing his composing process, his journey, tips for writing music for documentaries, his album and a lot more. Hi Patrick! Hey, hey Stefan, how's it going? Okay, <laughs> let me just turn my thing on the side. Okay. <laughs> no way, great to finally meet you. Yeah, likewise, how are you? Yeah, yeah not too bad, thanks. How about you, here with all the traveling? Oh yeah, it's been it's been a little bit crazy, but like really great, you know. Just uh, it's all been um, a bit of a whirlwind, like sort of like because um, uh, I was in LA. I think I've been back now for about a week or so, or maybe just over. So I'm over my jet lag, thankfully. But I was in LA for three weeks, um, and um, yeah, it was great. We recorded a score, and uh, I'm really happy with it. So yeah, and and it's always nice to be out there. I think a great place to start would be by asking you about your journey because you have a brilliant career and it's going great. Uh, but how did you start? Like, what were the choices you made that brought you where you are now, let's say? Yeah, so maybe just for a bit of talk context, um, I'm half Swedish, half Polish. So I was I was born in, in Sweden. I lived there until I was four, then um, lived in Poland until I was eight. But I actually grew up in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. So... I lived there from the age of eight until 18. So I feel like that informed a little bit of who I am probably. And, um, and uh, so I'm like, uh, and then I went to Berkeley and uh, studied at, in Boston, studied music. And then uh, me and my wife moved back to Europe because we wanted to be closer to family. So that's sort of my little journey. And then musically, um, so obviously I went to Berkeley and studied film composition, jazz slash film music school. Yeah. What year was it roughly just so we to understand? But... That was in 2007 that I went there, Gra graduated. Yeah. Um, and then um, I came to uh, UK. And so I was like, you know, I knew I, that I wanted to sort of like keep learning more about music and you know I, I i thought i wanted to be a film composer and that was sort of what i was really trying for and wanting to do but i knew that i had like holes in my knowledge when it came to like some of the more technical aspects of production and you know mixing and all that kind of stuff so i thought how can i sort of keep trying to do short films and getting better at at scoring and maybe getting to features if i can while at the same time sort of learning and and having a job so i I, I applied to um, uh, loads of studios and like uh, recording studios. And I thought that, you know, what better place to learn the technical side of things than to just try and get, in, you know, some kind of work there. And I think because I, I was a composer coming, applying, it was like a slightly different CV that came in than um, if I was like, a, you know, an aspiring engineer or something like that. So this particular place, um, um, a guy called Sean, he hired me to, as like a, a, to do it like a test month. Um, and uh, they were trying to set up like a composition little wing of their business. So the timing was just really lucky, basically. And um, yeah, and that's how I came to London. And, um, and to, to sort of the way I got into film scoring here, because in the States, you know, I had a few relationships with people, but um, but here I, I was like sort of blank slate in back in Europe. So um, I, um, there was a guy called Orlando who came in and he, he was gonna do his uh, film mix for his short film at the studio because he was a friend, old friend of Sean. And, um, and so I was, I was sort of, I was thrown into the deep end of the studio because the, the head engineer there, he, he actually left the job after a certain amount of time. So I became the sort of like, head engineer by default because I was the other person there and so there I would have been like recording like an accordion for example so I was quickly like googling how do you record accordion while the player's <laughs> in the room and stuff like that you know so it's like um but it worked out and then 
so I was supposed to be the person who was doing the, the sound design and mix for Orlando's film. And I was hired for two days, I think it was. And, um, and then overnight, uh, Orlando uh, had left the film there. And I was, I obviously wanted to be a composer. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to sort of go out on a limb here and score the opening of the film. And I'll show him to him in the morning and see what he thinks. And, um, and so I did, and he liked it. And so uh, now me and Orlando have worked together for many years. And, you know, it was another example of being lucky at the right place, right time kind of thing. That was good of you. Like, you know, I think, uh, yeah, you would have liked small risk, you know, okay, let's see how he reacts. And that, do you think that was the sort of the spark that turned things over for you? Like, or like a start? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, I'm a believer in that, like, like if I had missed that opportunity, then something else would have happened and my life would have gone in that yeah. direction or this direction. There's no like, sort of like, that's the path, I don't yeah. think. But like, but I love that path. And and I I feel that film went to Sundance and and it it did really well. And, and so like, that meant that I was like, oh, I can sort of maybe, maybe try and go down that path while I still have this, this job at the studio. So it was like perfect because I could, you know, make some income while at the yeah. same time as as sort of like, it's, I'm also getting better at the music side of things. Like if I had worked in like um, a bookshop or something, maybe I, I would have gotten better at like interpersonal skills and like, I would be reading all day, so I'd be getting smarter. But like, <laughs> so there's, there's something um, wherever you go, I think, but uh, but I, I'm so glad that it could be still in music. Do you think that your, you know, your, I don't know. I don't know how to say it, like your cultural heritage. You know, like you know, you were born in Sweden and Poland, Malaysia, America. Do you think they all influence your writing music, like somehow? Um, absolutely, they influence me as a person. So I suppose that influences my writing too, because um, I guess what you gravitate towards is probably some kind of a extension of your personality, whether you're you know, a brighter person, a somber person, how you, how you look at um, the equation of music or like, you know, the sort of, um, I don't know, a situation on screen emotionally and all that kind of stuff. So I would say, yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. That's great to hear. Yeah. And I think another thing uh, often comes up, I mean, forums or like people talking about, uh, you know, music school, like in Berkeley is one of the best in the world. I know there's always the question, you know, for up and coming composers, like, do you need to go to one of these schools to make it? Or like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, My thoughts are absolutely not, that you do not need to go to one of these schools and pay, you know, astronomical sums. Like, and I was really fortunate that I, I had family that could help me, my mom and dad. Also that the Swedish government gave me the stipend. Uh, we have this really good, um, sort of um, loan system in Sweden, which has, you know, helped me, made it possible for me, basically. And, um, um, but I, I mean, like, I feel like I learned so much from the internet, even now, today. So like, I, I can't imagine being like 13 and having the internet as a resource right now. And like, it's like quite incredible, like, but one thing that's really important though, I think from school, is the interaction with peers. And I, I feel like that's where I learned learned like 80% of the stuff that I learned or, or like 70%. But like, you know, it'd be a late night and we'd just be chatting about music because everyone's excited and we're young and we're excited about music. And that person has those influences, that person has those influences and it's just this melting pot of, of madness. And, um, and you, it's a place where you can fail um, in a safe way you're not going to lose your job because of you don't you didn't do it properly or something like that uh, and also i think they help you they push you to you know with your peers you mentioned like i don't know like i was a uh, i studied at F uh, national film and television school oh yeah, yeah. and uh, great, great school really yeah yeah school. definitely i really i really enjoyed my time there for sure and similar to you i moved to a new country and i didn't know anybody and that gave me like a nice network of people and made lots of friends 
and having other composers in my ear. I mean, there was a some sort of healthy competition. You know, they pushed you, you know, okay, to get better somehow. Because mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think so. I think that's an one of the benefit of, as you mentioned, like uh, going to a university school. But I agree mm -hmm. that it's not essential. Mm -hmm. Like people made it even without going there. Are you from Italy? From, are you yeah, from Italy? yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. from Italy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, amazing. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I did start there like, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, a bit less actually. And then my wife, she's English and she was where, where I met her in Italy. And then we moved back here and for my master's. And then, yeah, we, cool. we, we, we stayed here. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great place in England, like, uh, for like, uh, at least for films and kind of, kind of things. Yeah. And it, I feel like in the time that I've been here, I think I was saying like, I've been here for 12 years for the longest time, but I think I've been here for like 15 years now, 15 years. but, um, something like that. And I feel like the industry's grown in the UK since I've been here, actually. Um, like it feels like it. Have you ever felt or like thought about uh, approaching the Swedish market, like, you know, the film industry there. Or like, do you feel like attached to Sweden? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I go back to Sweden every year um, and, you know, like um, have family there and feel very connected to like this one particular part of Sweden in particular. And, um, um, but I, I don't have any friends in Sweden. Like the only people I know are, are um, family. And like their friends, so like they've become my friends, you know, by extension. But like, I don't know anyone in the industry. Um, there have been a few times when sort of like there have been some co-productions, and they threw my ha name in the hat because you know I was a Swede, so maybe that could help with some like tax thing or something. But none of that material ever <laughs> ever materialized. Yeah, <laughs> you seem to go quite a lot in America anyway, so it's more like America and the UK at least at the moment. I guess just because the the American market is this it's it's a big country with like there's more films being made there and I live here in UK so um yeah I think that's why I've done a couple of projects in like Hong Kong and China um uh, but that was you know some years ago um yeah besides that it's been pretty much mostly in Europe I mean you do all kind of things really not uh, but like a lot of your work seems to be documentary correct me if i'm mm -hmm. wrong yeah so yeah, is yeah. there because I, I don't know like i you know i'm a huge fan of yours <laughs> being a veteran, but love your music oh, and you. uh, everything no no really and i think your music yeah listen to is really suited for documentaries somehow uh, what are your thoughts on that like uh, why do, like do you think it's true like uh, is that like a coincidence that your style somehow um, I mean, it's hard for me to identify style myself. I think it's maybe other people can do that better, but like, I certainly have things that I gravitate towards, obviously, like we all do. But um, yeah, in terms of documentaries, like, I think the thing is that I try not to approach documentaries differently than I do fiction films. Like, I, I try to sort of like, I don't know, really, um, the thing about docs, I find is that which is maybe a little bit different sometimes is that I try to be sort of one beat. I don't mean a musical beat, like one, one moment behind like what's on screen. So I'm trying to react as the audience, uh, as opposed to sort of like, maybe like being ahead of them, especially in sensitive moments. Like I'll try to leave things alone a little bit more than maybe I would in a, in a fiction thing. Um, because you're dealing with real people with real situations and real issues. So I try to be respectful of that. And I don't know, maybe hopefully that's maybe what you mean is that like, it's the sort of um, the way I try to move around in a documentary, maybe. There's really good advice there, you know, which I also, you know, is also useful for everybody and for me as well, you know, like, I didn't think about, you know, react as the audience, not just like commenting on what's happening on screen, you know, be respectful, you know, to other people. And and also I, I love so much your, 
a combination of orchestral and electronic music. I don't know. It's so <laughs> seamless. It's uh, it's something that you develop through time. Like is you, you like your taste evolved with that, or like from the start you sort of knew, okay, this is like what I like to do, or like this is me. So. I I like both of those things. So I think it, it came organically, but it's certainly something I've developed over time. Like I love the the idea of like where you can't see the boundaries between the two things like if you manipulate an organic inst an acoustic instrument um into sounding more like something that was synthesized and something that's a synthesized instrument and making it breathe breathing life into it so you like you're sort of like purposely like confusing the audience a little bit so that they it becomes less important like what the instrumentation is and i think of it more as like energies sort of like um like um ebb and flow push and pull like intensity darkness lightness like filmic words you know like um that's how i tend to think about it rather than like um i don't it's not so conscious if that makes sense i'm like oh i'm not getting what i need from from the orchestra i need a lower extension like that's the oldest trick you know everyone does that but but that's like an example of of a way to to fuse the two things and uh, there are so many other ways you can do it too I mean, we'll talk maybe later about, but I felt that so much in your album that uh, and I've been listening to it quite a lot. And oh, thank it, you. It's just uh, like, uh, yeah, I just want I want to talk later in detail because you know I love that <laughs> album. But yeah, just talking about what you're talking about, you know, blurring the lines between those, you know, things. I think that you really, uh, you masterfully achieved that. And uh, yeah, so just quickly going back, uh, so from Orlando, then how do you went from there to, you know, the White Helmets that won an Oscar? Yeah, well, um, so same director. So so there, that's that's definitely the connection is that um, is that we, um, so Virunga started off as this small film that it was just Orlando with camera out in Eastern Congo. And um, and then it sort of like to, became this thing that was just like rolling and rolling and it became this big thing. And it was nominated for an Academy Award. And I think it was uh, picked up by um, by Netflix. Executive producer Leonardo DiCaprio as well. Y yes, uh, yeah. It was a help a bit for also for marketing reasons, you know, to spread oh, oh, it. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, those kind of things are just for a film, especially like a, an impact film which which actually did have a real impact in the region like the oil company like um you know it changed the the outcome uh, at least for the time and um and so having someone like like leo on board to to raise awareness is you know yeah, invaluable um yeah so then for white helmets um and orlando does this wonderful thing where he tells me about the projects like as he starts to think about them so he's not like, here's the finished film, go score it. But ra rather he's like, you know, let's it sort of like bubble in our heads for a little while. And I think that's really useful for um, the creative process because it means that you can sort of like um, do lots of like trial and errors in your head without actually having written a single note down yet. And then when you approach it, you're, you're obviously still gonna get it all wrong but at least, you know, you haven't done all those wrong things that you did in your head. Um, and um, yeah, and so so he asked me to do it, which was great. And I'm very thankful for it. And it was just a, a super powerful film. And I think my job was just to like, not get in the way, you know, just like sort of just to help the audience on this already beautiful journey. Like it's really powerful film and, and um, and yeah, no, it was it was an absolute pleasure. A tip for writing for documentaries: Would you say don't get in the way? Is a good thing. Yeah, um, I don't know. You know, I've been accused so many times by so many people of doing too much, and and um, and and I. But for me, sort of the only thing that matters is that the that you're sort of like you're honoring what you know these you're honoring these people, you're honoring the filmmakers and the vision that they have, and. I think you can have plenty of occasions where you can the music can come to the forefront and really you know be the be the story 
that's I don't think that's a problem at all. It's just I think it just needs to come from the place where you're thinking about it and that you're you're um you're aware of what you're doing. You're aware of sort of the the slight responsibility or big responsibility you have depending on the project. And I think if you come at it from that place then you'll make mistakes. It's fine. You know, it's like it's you're never going to make a perfect score or a perfect film. It's not possible. Um, but as long as it's honest, I think, and respectful, that's that's my my take on it. I love what you just said, you know, about being respectful and honest. It's like uh, something, I don't know. Yeah, I think we should all try to follow, I think, as, a, and, uh, as an advice. Yeah. And skipping, like, <laughs> in time, just to present days, there's something exciting coming out on December 21st wildcat also set in the jungle <laughs> i watched yeah, the trailer yeah. on your instagram it's like wow and it's really this soldier just for content soldier post-traumatic stress uh stress disorder and then a uh, friend of war and then ends up in in the jungle and uh, basically saving uh animals like felines there's this, this ocelot which is yeah. there's all this story be, uh between this soldier ex-soldier and this uh, animal and somehow i imagine this relationship heals him i don't know uh, how if you could yeah, yeah it would be great to hear your experience on the film and yeah yeah, yeah it's a it's a film uh, directed by uh, melissa lesh and, and trevor frost and um and it's a beautiful film and you know i was so thankful to them for approaching me to do it and they actually approached me like some years ago um but it took a while for because they were they filmed so many like they filmed like hundreds of hours of footage and and they you know they went back for multiple trips and we sort of were just kept in touch the whole time and and you know um but then um the film is about um yeah like you say he's a he, um a guy called harry who went to afghanistan when he was 18 and um he was discharged um and went back to England um, uh, because of PTSD, as you said. And um, and he actually um, decided that he was going to go to the Amazon and take his own life because he was re really uh, suffering a lot with this. And, um, and, you know, PTSD is a very common thing with veterans, as we all know. And it's something that's getting more and more known. And, um, but while he was there, he met, he happened uh, to stumble upon this uh, woman, her name is Sam, and um, she runs a wildlife rescue center there. And they had just found an ocelot, which is like a sort of a wild cat that is probably somewhere around that size or maybe a bit bigger. And, um, but they found a little kitten of that, a baby one that had been rescued from, from poachers, unfortunately. And, uh, but so Harry found sort of like a, a reason to sort of like go on uh, from day to day by sort of he's he was going to become this ocelot's mom and he was going to raise embark on this project where he was going to rewild um, this cat which they named Khan and um, and um, yeah so so sort of he's saving the cat but the cat's also saving him at the same time and and sort of it's this really interesting story about the healing power of nature and that's something that resonates really strongly with me and i think most humans that there's you know just some sort of like um profound thing about our connection with the the natural world and um particularly in dealing with sort of subjects of mental health and sort of rejuvenation and you know finding energy and life and um so, so musically, that's where I tried to sort of draw from within myself. So I, I hadn't experienced the same things that Harry had, but I, um, you know, had my own much smaller versions of whatever it was and my smaller versions of connection with nature. And so I would try and channel that stuff. And so, but I was always, always conscious of the fact that mental health is something that's not just like, it's a linear trajectory where like, oh, getting better, getting better, getting better, solved. It's not like that. It's sort of like a struggle that continues potentially for, for a lifetime. And so um, I wanted something in the music that had like a bit of complexity, complication, dissonance, 
that was always combating even the, the sort of more beautiful moments. And even in some of the writing of the the thematic stuff, like um, the relationship themes between, you know, Harry and Sam, um, that that relationship somehow, you know, wasn't going to last. And so you, by oscillating between major and minor resolutions or bringing in those complicated sounds or whatever it is that you're always keeping a subtle reminder to the audience that that things they're laughing and smiling but there's something under the surface that that demonstrates that that um that feeling that something is not full completely fulfilled inside and there's yeah so uh, that was my my approach to the whole score do you find that having themes helps your writing and this is like also maybe something i'd love to hear from you like as a a word of advice uh, when you work on long projects like that. So, um, you know, there are often characters in a journey and they change, as you say, probably there's some, something happens in the film that change the character, it's not static. So music wise, what would you say is a good way to do that change in music that goes with the character, like through the use of themes or like, uh, I don't know, yeah, so it's a, it's a difficult one to answer. So first of all, themes, yes, absolutely. Like, I feel like I can't enter a movie or a series until unless I have like some idea, like unless I hit upon something that makes me feel what I need to be feeling from that story. Like, it can take a second to figure it out, or it can take forever to figure that out, but. Without that, I feel like, like that's where I spend so much of my energy, is like, and sometimes it can be a sound that triggers something. So you know, like, for example, like your sound, your your sample libraries, or like any sample libraries, like that you'll just be you'll just be like trying stuff. And you're like, oh, hang on a minute, that could be like a gateway into the into the movie, you know, or it could be something sim super simple it could just be like you're setting an atmosphere yourself or it could be something really signature or it could be something that you play on an instrument or whatever but like i think that like that's like a sonic way in it's almost like you're like you've already started and you discovered and you get excited or it can be like more of like a academic way where it's like i need the theme to feel this way and you're sitting at a piano and i struggle sometimes because like, i always do it on piano normally but I struggle with that because sometimes I get so attached to how that sounds on a piano because it was written on a piano. And and I, it's it's like hard sometimes to break free from that. And uh, it's something it's like a lifelong figuring it out thing, isn't it? But um, but yeah, so advice about sort of like and how I approach it in the longer format. So um, I think it's like, in the beginning, I think I sort of like feel my way into scenes. I'm just like, that feels right. It's just, it's just a feeling. It's like you, the, the picture is giving you something back and you're like, it's like, um, I'm giving something to the picture. Now I feel something more from the picture than I did before. And so then you've like felt your way into like a few scenes and you're like, in general, this seems to be working. And then you're like, you've like, you're, you're like establishing a language. And then once you've established like a bit of a language, then more concepts will start flooding in and and you'll be like oh but we don't have something for you know the love theme like i was just talking about like or we don't have something for like the moment it's just supposed to be fun and it doesn't need to be like that complex emotionally like do do we just like use like would it be a disservice to the scene to actually use the theme there because that's see that theme is grounded in like so much stuff you know that it's like maybe we need something that's more of like an anomaly and like just we only hear it once and gone and like and may i tend to only allow myself like one of those maybe two and but i always try to fit one in because it changes the the it changes the tempo of the film as a whole it changes the the expectation of the film it it it, it, you're like testing your audience a bit, like if see if they're paying attention, and um, that's just me. But I think you can just like get a good theme and then use it, like 
don't be afraid to use it in different permutations. That's my, that's my approach. Well, I was slightly surprised, like, cause your music is, uh, I mean, there's so many textures. If you're on the piano by itself, you tend to write more like maybe melodically than texturally, if that makes sense. So do you have in your mind when you are at the piano, okay, this could be like, I don't know, strings, and then I'm going to add something on top. Like, do you build up things by things? Like how, how does it work? Usually. Yes. Yeah. So I just like orchestrate in my head, but like I orchestrate not just with like orchestral instrument instruments. Like I know that I'm like, oh, cool. Like here's the chord. I want like this tension to be sitting right in the middle and maybe my sub 37 could be, oh no, actually my sub 37 is a bit too thick for that. It's going to clash with this interval. So maybe it needs to be something more like, I don't know, whatever. And, and so like, and then it's like, I want to reinforce that with this, with the sub bass because I, I love a bass <laughs> and then you know maybe you want to double you have an implied melody that later on you can sort of like have the melody as a solo thing just like but you never actually play it on the and then you take the piano out of that whole thing and and you're like oh actually it's kind of cool that whole thing without the chord and and then you've got something you surprised yourself and you're like oh and then now i have room for a melody in there that's like i don't know it's just like experimentation i'm just making it up as i go along basically uh, and also you make your own i don't know like i did download them your sample libraries which you generously <laughs> released oh, to you, the public did you, did yeah i love them yeah yeah oh, of course cool. yeah yeah they're, they're amazing i was so generous of you um of it's course, great so yeah. is there there was yeah is that what you do sometimes for your projects then like bespoke sounds like that for each project yeah 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 absolutely like that's what i've been doing for the last three days actually is i just been making making noises and stuff and um and like because you have the process well sorry to answer your question first it's like yes i do i do that a lot where i i sort of decide like is it better for me to have that as audio and just throw it around or is it better for me to have that as an instrument and be able to like play it you know and then whatever the answer is to that question i'll do either build it if i'm like on my i don't know this one or whatever synth and i'm like oh that's a cool sound i better like bottle it <laughs> then then um then i'll do like you know whatever tritones up the scale or depends how much control you want um because i don't mind pitch shifting i think it sounds cool yeah especially lower i think sounds better like i don't know like I play the flute and I did some experiments and, you know, as you say, you're importing sampler. Um, if you don't map it, which I actually don't know how to do it, you just play with a keyboard. You just pitch it like up or down. So yeah. when it's slow, it actually sounds really nice. In a normal flute air with so much bass. And so yeah. I think, yeah, it's great to experiment. Yeah, really cool. Like, yeah, everything when it's like, down three octaves is just vibey isn't it but you can't have too many of those or you just you become this rumbly mess that's yeah, like out of yeah. control <laughs> yeah you can like have one of those and then something else or something but yeah really cool i didn't know you played flute, flute. that's great did you play yeah. on that uh brute flute no yeah, no you, no you I got didn't, someone no. in for that right he, yeah. yeah yeah so basically yeah now for cynic cinema i basically do like content creation like demo walkthroughs interviews but they work with uh, other musicians for for that. But yeah, I did. Yeah, I graduated in flute was like ten years ago, twelve years ago. Yeah, I love the flute. Yeah, play guitars, play the cello. Actually, the intonation is like insanely difficult to to get right. That's why I have. That's why I have. Um, I have one of these which has has frets, so that I don't have to worry about the intonation as a guitarist. <laughs> So at the end, actually, one day, unfortunately, I just woke up basically. And I just didn't love any more like playing, and I give it back. So, but you know, never mind. I think you know it's always one of those. I don't know if you have it as well. Sometimes you think, well, I would love to do something. Ah, oh, you know, maybe it's too difficult. I'm too, you know, there's not enough time. But then actually, say, okay, why not? Naturally, well, what's really stopping me? So that was the channel. Mm -hmm. Then. I started studying Japanese actually two and a half years ago oh, for the wow. same reason. So every day, Amazing. you know, I, so, you know, I don't know if you have one of those things like as well that you want to do it or like, you know, like something like that, you know, playing the cello or learning something. You know, it's like 
my absolute dream, but it's never going to happen. No chance. <laughs> is because um, Astor Piazzolla is one of my favorite composers in the world. Yeah. And, and um, uh, Bandoneon, like, like, it's just like, I think it's one of the most soulful instruments that exists. And like, is there one like doing like this, right? So, <laughs> yeah, but exactly. It's like an accordion, but it's the, the sort of like, you know, octo octagonal shape on the sides or whatever. And yeah. And like, um, yeah, it's a slightly different, darker, maybe reedier sound than the, the accordion. But like, if you play it and you put it on like a film, there'd be everyone would think it's an accordion and you can't get away with accordion on many scores. <laughs> so, um, but, but um, yeah, it's my dream to be able to play that. But like I said, I mean, the learning curve is just, crazy on something like that it's gone. i wouldn't have like guessed that <laughs> you would have that would be your sort of like dream like about the panel yeah well i i love um flamenco like it's probably my fam favorite type of music like um um paco de lucia was is like my favorite musician of all time and um and there's something like akin there's like a kinship between like t the, the sort of energy of flamenco and the energy of tango which is like it's like like kind of like like i used to, i used to be in a punk rock band and like i it's like sort of like a bit punk rocky you know what i mean but like but with much more history and and more sort of um passion and culture to it but like um so maybe that's why i gravitate towards those kind of things oh i would have never guessed because you know like i think there's definitely something nordic about you your music you look like be like <laughs> it's way easier so you know about the flamenco and, stuff, and this kind of thing you're like yeah that comes yeah, as, as an expected it's not in my music i don't think but it's in 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 what i like wow yeah. wow yeah so just quickly because you mentioned like uh, influences like i feel like uh as now i'm very curious like what would you say would you be your top three like influence like as a composer like you mentioned Ooh. astor piazzolla yeah, I mean, like, like I think that he's, um, I mean, he he's influenced me so much, but I I don't know how much of his stuff is in my music. Maybe it's more in like that I try to find intensity in the energy and stuff. I don't know, but um, I mean, I love Radiohead, Johnny Greenwood. Like lately, I'm loving like like Mika Levy, everything she does is amazing. Trent Reznor, like, and then from the more classical people, like um, James Newton Howard, um, I, I mean, more Hollywood. Um, um, yeah, I mean, there's just so many, like, but I think one person that I really, you know, respect and sort of wish we still had him around is Johan Johansson. And um, like, I think that, um, yeah, I don't know. There's some, there's like a real sort of feeling that he was like pushing the boundaries, you know, and was like um, really had like a, a voice, and that he and and I was always like, oh, what's he gonna do next? Like what you you'd hear he was attached to a film or something. It's like oh, I can't wait. Like I'll go see that film just just because he's uh, involved. And I can't think of many composers at all that I would go see a film just because they're involved. Like, cause I don't sit around listening to film scores that much, but like, um, actually I don't really, um, but, but his stuff was just, you know. Yeah. Um, I really think special. he's universally really respected and by everybody mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's such a shame, but yeah, I mean, you mentioned really like some of the really good co contemporary. So there's definitely something about big contemporary music, like Mika Levy, Jenny Greenwood, Jan Johansson, something. I mean, all the all the good stuff, the great influence. I would say, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. Like everyone would say the same answer, but um, but it's for it's true for me. I'm a big fan of this plot. I gotta say, he's the one that moves me yeah. the most when I, yeah. He's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I do love also yeah. Abel Kurnikowski, like something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a absolutely. Polish composer. Yeah, yeah. He's brilliant. I'm. I'm I always i'm always so curious like his music's so classy you know it's so like yeah, yeah with the um, tie yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah but, yeah, but i 
I feel like I felt that even before I knew like how he dressed and stuff like that. Just like you can hear it in his music. It's like, you know, it's like mm. proper composer. He's like really sophisticated. He's brilliant. Yeah, I think he had like this, this famous Polish composer. Uh, gosh, I don't remember now. Like classical, like conte very, very contemporary. Penderecki, I think. Yeah, yeah, Penderecki. Yeah. Yeah, I think he studied yeah. him. Yeah. Are you serious? Wow. I mean, that's insane. Like, like Penderecki's uh, Trinities for Victims of Hiroshima is like, a, like one of the like big works, you know, in the history of music, you know. Um, he's like a legend, absolute legend. And actually, Johnny Green was heavily inspired by him, I think. Um, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that as well. Yeah. I think I think his influence is in a lot of scores. Though. I don't know. I've probably something by Hans Zimmer as well, though, if I'm honest. Or like, but yeah, I mean, Penrick is another one <laughs> that really could say that he made an impact on a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, me too, for sure. I mean, I, I, I learned about that. We studied it when I was at Berkeley. And, and it was like, it was a, a revelation. When I, when I, same with Rite of Spring, Stravinsky, you know, like Alban Berg, all of, you know, all the repertoire stuff, obviously. I think it's somehow hard nowadays to write scores like that, if you, especially for films, like, I don't know, but there's certainly something that you can take away from, the, like, I think the best way in this kind of thing is like, maybe you listen and study a lot and then you, take away something and then you made it yours in your music rather than like trying to imitate mm -hmm. like you know Stravinsky I think because uh, I don't know like first I think they are so recognizable that people will guess immediately oh, okay this is like just somehow quoting Stravinsky or like and you will get you know like uh, you know the right of springs the staccato string dun, 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 you know like mm -hmm. if you do something similar like that yeah. I think it's it's a bit obvious, but I think if you know Penderecki, Stravinsky, if you can go to the essence of the music, if you want to get something, out, I don't know. It's hard to explain it with words. No, I know, I know just what you mean. It's like you sort of like have to internalize it and like make it your own, right? Like I think one one piece of advice that I heard or someone told me, I think I heard somewhere in an interview, was that um, try and figure out like the influences of the people who are influences to you so like sort of like you skip a step and you listen to the stuff that inspired these people that you really admire because you've already internalized these this person that you ad admire and so like what is it where did what is it that what are the building blocks that made them and you will create something of your own there i think and i thought that was pretty interesting that's great. That's some fantastic advice, actually. I mean, you get you gotta have to somehow know who was inspired by this. There's a there's a bit of research of it, but I probably can guess something. But that's part of the the adventure, right? If it was yeah. easy, it'd be easy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there's something that also another like a film that you scored or like a scoring I'd like to talk about is Crapper, mm -hmm. which is like I think it's in post production still. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I I think I think it's finished now. Finished so right. um, okay. it's been it's been mixed and graded, and you okay. know this the score is in there hopefully still, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no no but that was like such an amazing project to be involved with, and um, uh, the director is Charlotte Reagan, and uh, we've done a bunch of short films together in the past, and she asked me if I wanted to do this her first feature, and um, yeah, it's a it's a story about a a young girl who has lost her mom. So it's a story of of grief, but it's it it's like such an interesting film, and like it's there's so much comedy in it, and it's not a comedy, you know, but it's but there's so much like life to this uh, young character, and she rekindles her relationship with um, her dad, who comes back following the death of they they had her when they were very young. And so it's like this this bond forming uh, between the daughter and father, and it's it's a really touching story, and right. um, I'm super proud of it. Because I was actually looking for the trailer, but I couldn't find it. It's not out yet. It's probably not out yet. It's been picked picked up by Picture House, uh, um, so so it'll be in cinemas, but um, I don't know exactly what date yet, and. Um, 
hopefully there will be more news soon because i read there's this magical element to it like she's imagining thing like you know the power of imagination things like a tower coming out from the bedroom or something something oh if you know. oh is that public okay well then i can talk about it that's well no i i just i did some research and that, okay. that was that that's, was a good find yeah that's perfect that's perfect because yeah actually so so for that one because I, I like to think about these things like as i'm conceiving the ideas um the tower that she builds is made out of like metal like scrap metal and pieces of so i was like the score has to be metal so um so you know it's like got a percussionist in for like pots and pans and bicycles and like chains and all kinds of weird stuff and we would like throw it across the studio <laughs> or we would like, like that studio or stuff. Uh, no. No, that was recorded in the pool um it's a, one of the maloko studios all right a really cool cool room um recommended oh, there's a pool it, uh, no, this the studio is called the pool. Sorry, I, okay. I imagine you in a pool, swimming pool, like bashing. No, like, no that that would have been a good idea. That that was the idea. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. No. So um, so we just yeah made some noises and then got some uh, brass um, players in and uh, some woods and yeah, just made lots of noises and uh some of it made it didn't make it into the film but lots of it lots of that stuff from that session did and oh really okay yeah. so you, oh awesome wow sounds very interesting and i also read that the relationship with the father is you know it's kind of difficult she was happy actually by herself and the father actually comes in and, you know you're super somehow facing reality like mm -hmm. uh, how how did it go with, like music wise like for the father it was like, like uh, some uh specific instruments or it was like a mood yeah well so so again my way into the film was to find the you know a theme for what whatever i thought was sort of the the anchor for us as an audience and for me that was the relationship between georgie the girl and her mom that she had lost and sort of i felt like if i could figure out what that sounds like that i could navigate my way through the film and sort of like that's something to hold on to and that's the way it, it played out like once we figured once we found that it was like i mean it was it was a, it was one of the harder films to score that i've ever done because it's um i think there's not that many cues there's maybe like 12 like 15 cues or something in it whereas like i just did a film um the one i don't know if we'll talk about it after if you wanted to or not but that it was had like 36 cues or something like that or like or, yeah and then and then you know this this one had like i don't know less way less than half of that and so but like the level of like detail we went into because it was such a balancing act because you're dealing with grief but it also has to be like a bit sort of from her perspective, from a little girl's perspective, and she's youthful and full of life and energy. And, but there's also the complication of like her relationship with the dad, like you mentioned. And so it's like very much, I find that all this, all the scores I work on are always this balancing act of like, you push it a bit too far in that direction. You, is it a chord? Is it a timbre? Is it a tempo? What is it that that's pushing it too far in that direction? How do we bring it back? You know? I think a question that popped out in my mind now, because you talk about grief and uh there's another film you scored uh evelyn or evelyn i don't know what's the right pronunciation evelyn uh, evelyn, evelyn, yeah. evelyn like, you know it's also about grief and um, the question i have is do you think that you know now you learn you know for your past projects you know in this case let's say grief you know the loss of someone okay music wise I know where I don't want to go because you learn it in previous films. Like, did you find that in, in this case also with the scrapper? Like he sort of like knew, okay, I don't want to do that because I tried before and it wasn't working for me. Yeah, for sure. You, we learn on every project, right? But also like, I find that like my relationship with the picture is always so like based on like how it's shot colors you know like tempo the performances of the actors like 
so I feel like something that may be too big on one film may be just right on another film and like I wouldn't want to like always be narrowing myself down as my career goes to like get to this point it's like this is how I always do grief yeah this is how I always do no no of course yeah stuff <laughs> and I, that's not what you meant of course no 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 but, of like, course I, no I, yeah it's a good point I think I think that would maybe be my only worry is like how do I keep an open mind and just like like because I'm limited already and like because you know um, I, I'm I do the things that I always do so like how do I get away from the things that I always do and like how do I actually throw something at it that's like not like not me and um, like I'm always trying to sort of like get out of my own brain and like putting something there that I can observe I don't know if that makes any sense but, yeah um, for sure yes yeah. uh, I agree like uh, it's a um... I think, yeah, everything is different, you know, colors, character, the story, the way it's shot, inspired in different ways. So it could be very well, actually, that one thing that didn't work in another film might might work in this. So I think, yeah, keeping in, keeping an open mind. But but probably wouldn't, right? Probably wouldn't work. But I, I, I'm I okay to make the mistake again, if, if you know what I mean. Because I think, actually, one problem we have with this whole concept is that often we don't have so much time to work on projects. And then, you know, like maybe for TV series more than maybe features, but like, okay, we need the score in like three days. Uh, you kind of like go where, you know, where, you know, you know, we, we, the, you know the muscle yeah. memory on the keyboard, somehow like that. Yeah. Uh, so that actually is yeah. very limiting for, I think for, you know, your, your creativity and like, you know, exploring new things. So do you find that in your work, you have enough time to... I think documentaries usually take so long, years probably. So mm -hmm. maybe that allows you to be creative and experiment more than other uh, type of media. I find it very difficult to work on multiple projects at the same time. So I will work on one project and then I'll work on another project. And then like, you know, it's... I've done things before where I've had overlap, like definitely happened but i try my absolute best to make it so that i can do that and i try to just be really clear with everyone about what i'm doing so that i can i don't want to like tiptoe around you know like I, I just want to be like i'm working on this until that date and like and inevitably it'll last for two weeks longer than it was supposed to obviously and this one will move and everything moves but that happens all the time but um time is really important to me in terms of like being able to do a good job so um and you don't always have it um so i don't know like it's tricky i've been really lucky lately that i've had good amounts of time to work on the things that i've done mm -hmm. like this last one that i did for boogeyman that was like i had several months to work on it and um scrapper we did over a few months too and wildcat too so you know it's been um I've been really lucky, but but then that's not always going to be the case. And sometimes you have to rely on that muscle memory where, but I think something cool can come from that too. Sometimes where it's a bit like rock and roll wild. You're just like, okay, I have one shot to get this right. If I don't get it right today in this one sitting here in these two hours that I have to come up with ideas, then uh, I'm screwed. So <laughs> there's a bit of like, interesting pressure that comes from that too yeah. and you just start like it's almost like you're performing in front of people or something and um you just got to get it right <laughs> and yeah. uh and something happens you know and like yeah and then and it's a whirlwind and then it's done and it's out and it's out and it's in the world <laughs> and you're like oh hey that was pretty good actually do you go to the premieres of your films usually like when you premiere at the cinema how do you feel like when you know music is on the big screen like uh happy I nervous very, i sink very low into my seat uh when the movie starts um but um no but i love being in a cinema with people it's like especially if they didn't know i was working on it then you can like sit next to people and see if they're laughing or crying or reacting or not reacting when you hoped that they would <laughs> and uh and everything in between or but they always surprise you they always react in places where you didn't expect and you're like oh yeah that is a great moment and like how, that just passed me by a hundred times but 
it brings you back to the first time you saw the movie and like um i love it like it's probably my second favorite part of a film my favorite part is um when it's all like exciting and you have to come up with the ideas and then it gets really intense and scary and everything after it and then the very end where it's like oh um you know, we did something cool there, hopefully, and we get to share it with an audience. So I, I love it. How do you deal with the, uh, sorry, this is like, feels like an interrogation, but I'm just so curious, because, <laughs> you know, when do, you, uh, when do I get the chance to otherwise to ask you these things? And uh, like, uh, and hopefully, you know, are helpful for people like me watching. I hope so. I I, I just make it, make it up as I go along, like I said, so, but, you know. <laughs> when you receive like negative feedback from the director, producer, like about trucks, how do you deal with that? I mean, it's literally every day that I get um, uh, that I get some people saying that something's wrong with what I've done. So it, it's a great exercise because, like, I'm just like, oh yeah, shit, yeah, that, you're so right. That is wrong, and it's just like I see them not as someone who's like, I have to like get past in order to get my music in the film, but rather like we're collaborators and they're trying to like make, help me make better music for this project. And it's like being in a band together or something, you know? So like, they're like, Hey, what if you tried this? Like if someone's rude, which has, you know, hasn't happened to me for years, um, then I kind of, that's not cool. But if, um, but if it's just like, you know, feedback on the music, I don't take it personally in, in any kind of way. And if I disagree, I'll, I'll say that I disagree. Um, and, and I'll say, well, no, because I think it's right because of X, Y, Z. And then they'll say, ah, okay, well, I don't agree with that part, but here, maybe I can see where you have a point. And it becomes a conversation. And then we make something that's both of our brains together rather than just their brain or, or my brain, um, which I, I think is cool. Wow. You have a really great attitude. Like, yeah, because I think it's easy to get defensive. Like, you know, my idea is great. You're completely wrong. <laughs> Of course, especially early, especially early in the project, it's very easy to get defensive because you're, you're like, you think you have these grand ideas about, but when you're presenting something new, it's, that's a delicate moment, I think, and it's a scary one. Yeah, but well, I think you need to write a book because all the things you've been saying, you've been saying today are so helpful and wise and, uh, you know, things that can really make a difference for uh, for everybody you know composer you know being in a band together actually they are not really hating your music they, they we're just trying to get the best for the film and you know collaborating rather than you know taking it personally which i think is not you know you need to have some maturity i think but it's easier for me to sit here and say that like in a really like disconnected way but of course i have moments loads of moments where i'm stressed i'm like oh shit i don't know how to solve that or like you know or i i disagree but i don't know like why i disagree and i have to discover what my point of view is so it's like it's not just like happy days all day long it's like it's a it's definitely a struggle as well on this note of feedback from other people i think could we could uh uh, go into your album where I don't, you were your own boss, boss, I think, you know, your own director yeah. and producer, <laughs> yeah, which yeah. is very difficult, probably, you know, like, so uh, uh, suddenly we look like giants released in 2018. Feels like a lot less than that. Oh, really? For me, it feels like ages ago. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It doesn't feel like so long, but I remember actually when you were releasing your singles one by one on, on you know, oh, on, yeah. on that, and then... Thanks for the support. I, I really appreciate it. Really, like, I love that. And uh, it's such a great album. And I will, you know, I don't know, maybe it's not, I don't know, if it, it does feel like a long time for you, but I think for fans, of, of your music uh it would be great to <laughs> we just chat you know briefly about it like uh, why did yeah, you decide sure. to make a uh, this album what inspired you and so on yeah how interesting it's it's the um the sort of relationship with nature and the healing power of the world around us that was sort of the catalyst and the photo on the cover um 
it's like you know that thing that happens if you have the shadow behind you mm-hmm. from like a, yeah. a low a low sun or like it, it happens everywhere but there's something that happens when you're up in the north like up in sweden or or further that the the shadows are like i mean it's it's crazy and um and so like there was a photograph that um my wife took of the two of us and that is actually the cover is designed by her and um oh, that amazing. that's sort of like a, a re imagination of that photo that that she took and um and so suddenly we look like giants is sort of like specifically referring to that but also to sort of yeah i don't know to it's like sort of like i don't know there's like titles in there like hubris and like um yeah something we look like giants where it's like these notions of self and things like that and and um our relationship with ourselves and with the world around us and things like that it's all very profound and sort of like intangible when I say it like that, but for me it was a feeling, sort of, that I, and I've I, I'd been working on so many projects where I was um, working to picture, and so it's funny because like I kind of feel that now because I've been outputting a lot of music in the last few years, I sort of again feel this like real need to like do something musically that's like just like a bit like like that. I would never call that album wild because it's not, but like maybe it's the same thing. It's like that like thing I talked about, like the Astro Piazzolla and the Flamenco, all that sort of it, the feeling is that, but I think the output that I make is not necessarily like that. But um, so that was the sort of driving force. It was like this feeling that I really wanted to do it. And also it was a hell of a challenge. And one of the hardest things at least up until that point, it was one of the hardest things that I'd ever done creatively. And um, it's partly that because I didn't know how to frame it. I didn't know what the boundaries were, like, cause it was like completely open. There was no, nothing to tell me. Like w- when I put play something as picture, I've been watching movies since I was a kid. And and like the, the I, I used to watch like two, three movies a day um for years and years and years so like i feel like i have this repertoire of like film language in my head and so like when i watch something and i play whatever i've taken from all that time like is my way to like what i think works but i don't but if you take away that half of the equation then i'm just like throwing stuff out and so i wrote loads and loads of uh, songs that didn't make it into the album like I have a whole voice memo thing on my phone like of like um, loads of tracks that are not on there and because uh, they they didn't really do anything for me and um, so I was like at one point I had to curate and be like okay even if it's just like three four bars of something that I feel something from like and I just identified all these moments and then I, I was like okay there is my picture like there's the way that I that's my way in, and um, and so I did that, and and um, then I recognized that I needed a producer, um, somebody, and so I, the album was very close to being there, but then I got my friend Brett Cox, who's an incredible uh, producer, asked him if he wanted to like come on board and like just pull the songs apart for a little bit, like on his own without me being anywhere nearby. And he spent like a couple of weeks on that. And then he sent me some stuff back and I was like, this is really cool. You mean like you gave him like stems and you sort of rearrange or like mix some like, uh, cause I actually never understood like in, in a, I don't know if it's the same, like, you know, for like pop rock album, like producer, like I thought it was like more like a feedback, like you could do that. But this uh, person actually uh, pass your audio files together. Is yeah, it... yeah, yeah. Because I think normally, normally it, it's like you say it'd be someone who's like you sit on a sofa and you you drink a beer and you talk about music. Yeah. But um, I just think about Rick Rubin. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's such, he's such a legend. Like, I feel like if he's in any room, whatever's being worked <laughs> yeah. on is better. Um, but but yeah. So so with. With Brett, it's the same. It's like if if we did that in the same room, we'd just be like, "Oh, get all excited!" But I didn't want to be part of that process because I'd been like working 
like I knew every second of all of that stuff. So I was like, take the Pro Tools files and see you later. And and he knows he's not gonna like just completely like delete everything and start again. Yeah. So um so he just like and he didn't do stuff just for the sake of doing it either. Like there are places where he just he's like, it's great, leave it. And then other stuff where he's like added cool things. Like he, he taught me this cool trick. Sorry, Brett, if I'm giving away your trick. I'm just about to use this on this project where he taught me this thing with the pestle and mortar. It's like a really cool pad. You probably can't hear it through Zoom, but it's like, yeah, if you yeah, take that, yeah, you just put that very delicately at the top of something and, and it starts to like sizzle a bit, you know? And um, I need uh, to try that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do have one. <laughs> it's so funny that you have one yeah. in your studio. <laughs> yeah, it's it's never been in the kitchen. It's never been <laughs> really? in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, I can't, don't even wear, remember when I bought it. But um, yeah, sorry, tangent. Um, so um, Brett did incredible things. And then Nick Taylor, who mixed it, did incredible things. Yeah. And then Cicely Baston, who uh, mastered it. She must have my album Smash. as well, actually, funny enough. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, that did my, yeah, my debut album, yeah. Uh, She's amazing. Hey, I haven't yeah. heard your album. Um, I'll have to check it out after. Ah, thanks, man. Uh, it's called Solitary Places. And funny enough, also, it was inspired by nature and, you know, the feeling you get when you are in this uh, place, like, you know, where there's nobody and just immersed in nature. Like, yeah, it's just a long process. And the fact that there's, I didn't actually have a producer. So the, as you say, there are infinite possibilities, like it's too much, too many. Like, where are you going? Like with the next, like, is there a story I'm telling? Okay, what I want to say. And, and there's also the aspect, which is not to disregard, like who am I writing for really? Like, am I writing for me? Or am I writing for people that would like this music? Do I want to get on Spotify playlists? Cause at the, I had like, you know, a few thousand monthly listeners now and then like probably to 200. And every time I had lots of listeners was because there was something in playlist. Like, you know, and it just seems like, I don't know, like at the moment, like unless you are like, you know, as famous as you are, like, you know, like big name, like Oliver Arnold's. Oh, I'm, I'm not in on the same stratosphere as those guys. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's something that unless you are in like in playlists, it's hard for people to proactively go and listen to your things if you're not, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's crazy. Cause like, it, it's such a trap to try and write for playlists because like you, the, to try and predict like getting on the playlist is like, like the, the tracks of mine that are on playlists, I would never have thought would be the ones like, okay, suddenly like a giant is like the, the title track. So that one got on a couple, so fine. You, you kind of really have to like go from the other side that you're writing for yourself because like if you're growing if you're, you're actually connecting with real people like you could have loads of plays and like no one knows who you are still do you know what I mean whereas you could have like no plays but 10 people like you're their favorite artist or something like that's surely worth the hell of a lot more than like um because yeah I don't know it's 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 an interesting Thing. especially you know these days i don't know if you are on social medias yeah you are actually but you know there's a spotify wrapped you know the at the end of the year oh yeah that was yesterday i i, I saw i saw mine yesterday because they sent a little notification thing yeah it's, it's interesting to watch it. It, it sorry go on i'm interrupting you go on go on no but it just i don't want to sound rude or maybe i sound just jealous i don't know but it just seems like a slight brag like how many plays and listeners i had every year yeah. like oh you know i got like two million plays of course it is it's like a it's like a hum humble brag right it's like yeah but but it's like something to be proud of for sure um but yeah also like i, th I do think that number of like actual engagements like with like actual like people who are engaging with your stuff is is worth more than like how many you know years were of music i don't understand that thing it's like your music was listened to for 10 years and i'm like it's it's like i don't i don't quite understand it's like a high number but it's not it doesn't make any sense you know to me at least 
But, you know, I agree so much with what you said. Like, you know, um, I had like my Japanese teacher actually and, and another fellow student, like they shared with me privately that I was in their top five, you know, most listened. Oh, wow. That was so touching, like really. That's where it's more, right? That's that's like the real stuff. Yeah. Often now music, it feels like, uh, com you know, a commodity, like, you know, they do playlists because people want something in the background. How often do the people actually listen for the pleasure of listening? Like, pro pro you know, you sit down and you really appreciate the music. How how often does it happen? Like, let's face it, like... People should buy record 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 players. People should buy record players. Because um, I, I find that the, the fact that every few songs you have to get up, flip the thing over and make the decision. Because, like, the music finishes and you're like... Like... Oh shit! I I want to keep listening. So then, do I want to listen to the same album one more time, or do I want to like keep going on the journey? Like, there's something about being able to hold it that makes it less disposable somehow. Um, do you think like you would write because you've been for years? Like, can your fans expect new album in the future, or was that one and last? Oh, oh no, it's definitely not the last one. Like. I've been, I have already written songs for the next album that um, I have again on my voice memo thing. And uh, and some of them are probably crap and some of them are hopefully are okay. But um, for me right now, the complicated thing is how do I, because I'm, I'm doing quite a lot of scoring work. So how do I find like a, a window where I can like set aside some time to do it and stuff. So, um, It'll probably be like when I've got a, a gap between stuff. Because you know? I am I really want to. I'm really excited to do it. And there's something cool about being in the studio with like a different kind of pressure. Less pressure, but also still pressure. It's just different. I don't know. Like I like to just book a day in the studio and, and go and see what happens too. Because there's something like wild and fun about that. Like it's that thing again, you got to figure it out on the spot. Otherwise you've wasted a studio day <laughs> are you taking things in a different place sonically like is does it feel like a different journey or like a complement to what you have uh, no i want to i want to do something different so um uh, I, I i'm you know the themes are things that are like with, within me so i'm sure there'll be something related to that kind of thing but um but I, so lately, lately I've been thinking a lot about what is it like, I don't know, you know like Beatles songs where you sometimes feel that they've just like taken two pieces of music and they just like went like that and like they just chop, chopped a bit off and then, you know, but it's perfect and you go on this journey like how did we end up here? What the hell is this? And, but it's great. And so it's like, I want to see if I can be a little bit less sort of um pretty in what i do next sort of like a, a little bit less um i don't want to say predictable because i tried already on the last one to not be too, too predictable but to to like um to go on a journey more maybe you know to like just where you it's not point a go on a journey and come back to point a again but maybe we end up in like x which is like a different genre of music or something. I don't know, you know, I have no idea, but I'm I'm trying to be open-minded to that and see what happens. As a last question, so we mentioned like, you know, at the moment, you can, you're working on a very, very big film called Boogeyman. So I know it's early days, it's not much we can talk about, but yeah, whatever you can share with us, we'll be grateful. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's like, such a been such a cool experience like i went out to to la and was there for um for three weeks which was crazy because i just had a baby and i had me and my wife had a daughter in in the summer thank you in july and then she was only three months when i had to like fly to the states to to go and record and mix everything so it's like i was like it was such a nerve-wracking time to be like but my wife was such a champion and you know she and uh, my mother-in-law and like they held the fort so well and i missed missed uh, all of them so much but um 
but it was really cool project to be out there with and like i had a blast and like you know we did all those amazing things like we went and recorded a, a fox at the newman stage my son achieved there like wow that's an iconic studio you you pinch yourself yeah and like going to this like rocket ship of a of a control room and like um you know we mix in seven one and then atmos and stuff like that and and it's just like sounds really great and the players are so amazing in the room and everyone who helped contribute to the score and in terms of like the orchestrators and the, the copyists and the mixer and music editor like just everyone and and um it's directed by rob savage who's a good friend and um and uh he absolutely smashed it on the film and it's super scary and it's yeah. amazing <laughs> yeah i remember the 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 twist at the end from the story <laughs> I, I, we wouldn't reveal it maybe for the, the well, the, yeah, well yeah. you know the, sh the short story is out there in the world um but i can't comment can't comment on obviously the specifics of this one but um the yeah it's it's really scary it's fun was this your first horror mm, i've actually worked with some on some short films with rob before the same director um which is why he was you know took a leap of faith in me and brought me on board and i was so thankful to everyone at you know the studio as well for for letting us um work together on the film and um yeah it's it's completely different to anything i've done before music musically um so that was super fun and um yeah hopefully people like the film and the score yeah do you have like a, i mean I don't know if you can show like do you know roughly when it's going to come out like next year or like uh, even yeah after, it'll be next year it'll be next year yeah I, i'm not sure exactly when yet i don't actually know um but um but i don't think it's going to be super long wait i don't think yeah because normally when they when these um when you wrap on on a film you know it doesn't take forever for it to come out after um well i'm sad to hear it because uh, yeah in, i bet because I, I'm not used to probably hear horror from you. So I, I'm very interested to where, you know, what journey you're gonna take me on, like musically. Like I can imagine being very scary. I try to have fun with it and um and yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully it's it, people find it interesting. I I love doing it and um I tried not to just do the sort of pads, but it's 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 always it's always sort of um doing things and and uh and rob loves to work with music so um so we had a lot of fun with it, it was... yeah and it's a feature right uh yes yeah because this yeah because the the, the sh like the story is fairly short somehow isn't it like remember yeah the the story is yeah. it's a short story of his yeah because so yeah so there's uh here it was, it's going to be really stretch or like maybe with new additions but you know we'll see like you know i don't want to put in the on the spot <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah awesome all, all will be revealed uh soon enough uh wildcat is coming out so i'm gonna enjoy that at the cinema hopefully the soundtrack will will come out around the same time as well fingers crossed i'm gonna try my best to make that happen um but yeah i'll send you all the all the stuff when i can as soon as i can yeah yeah definitely thank you uh, well, uh, yeah, that was my question. Like, thank you so much for today. I hope it was okay for you. Like, you know, sorry, so many questions, but again, no, like, you know, I'm a fan and it's so interesting to hear your takes on, you know, everything, your attitude, your philosophy of composing process. Like, I honestly, like, it was fantastic. So, thank you so much for this. Thank you so much, Stefan. Like, you know, it's a pleasure and, like, I don't feel qualified to give any advice to anybody, but if it's any anything out there is useful that I, that we just talked about, then then you know, because I watch these kind of things um, less now because when I've been busy and stuff. But like, I love watching these kind of things and learning from other people and sort of like how they approach things and and even if you know the way I approach it is different, it's just still interesting to to like hear hear people and and they're all they're they're yeah because like. I think we're all in the same boat trying to like just figure it out right and like just navigate this this thing um yeah thank you so much all right cool thank you bye bye, bye.